Hello, beautiful friends. I am Laurel Bleeden Maffei with Illuminating Souls, welcoming you to this episode of Sleepy Bedtime Blessings, a podcast designed to help you rest, relax, and fall asleep, all while deepening in your connection with your beautiful team of angels who love you so. If we're meeting for the first time, I am an angelic practitioner, a spiritual teacher, and an encourager of souls. And I do this through one-on-one angel sessions, which take place over the phone. They're an hour long, and they're filled with love and wisdom for you. I also offer soul mentoring, which provides for ongoing consistent support as you move through a time of transition or growth or healing. And I also offer a variety of classes designed to inspire your spirit. And you can learn more about my offerings at my website, illuminatingsouls.com. I also have a Facebook page of the same name and a daily inspiration email blast where I will send you an inspiring message every weekday. Just visit my website and you can learn all about it. But for now, the angels and I are here to help you rest. And I want to begin by saying thank you for finding your way here. Perhaps you're listening because we know each other or you've participated in a class or you're part of the Facebook page. You bring your love there. So whatever led you here, I am so deeply grateful. And if you have been enjoying the podcast, I have a small request. And that is if you would please go leave a rating or a review on iTunes or Google Play or wherever you listen to the podcast, that would be wonderful. It helps other people discern if this would be a podcast that they might enjoy. So thank you in advance for getting the word out there through word of mouth because between you and me, I don't have the energy or inclination to do any marketing push myself. I am relying wholly upon divine marketing, angelic marketing, (laughs) 101 to ripple word of this podcast out into the world so you can be a part of the sleepy bedtime blessings family by rippling word of it out into the world and I will be so profoundly grateful for that so thank you So as I record this, I am kind of in a wandering space of consciousness. Oftentimes when I get ready to record an episode, I have a sense of where we'll go. Not necessarily in the first part of the podcast, because this first part tends to be a bit of channeling with the angels, a bit of stream of consciousness. But I typically know where we're going in the second part of the episode, which is when I read you a story. And I will tell you today, I'm not quite sure where we're going. I woke up this morning with some ideas and when I read to you, something from public domain, it has to be published 
1926 or earlier. So I do a considerable amount of research finding elements to share with you. So sometimes I'll read to you from a book. We've been reading from Little Women or Anne of Green Gables. Sometimes I find an old magazine or publication and read excerpts from it. And I love doing those because I love history, but those tend to take a little more time because I have to read through quite a bit to find the content. And then I also tell you stories. And I'm not sure what we're going to do right now. And so I want to sort of contemplate the fine art of wandering with you in this first segment of our podcast. As a creative being, I find it so helpful to give myself permission to start in the middle, in the messy middle, when I don't really know the beginning and I don't know the end. It's a lot like life, right? Life requires quite a bit of wandering, exploring, seeking. And so if you're in a place in your life where you don't yet have the answers, let it be okay. There's something about being in the middle. There's something powerful about wandering about seeking. And it can be uncomfortable sometimes, but especially in a time like the one that we're in. So much about life is shifting. And we can't always see where we're going. I think I may have shared this quote with you before. I, I know for sure I've shared with you one of my favorite quotes from Rilke, which talks about living the question. He says, this is me paraphrasing, sometimes you have to live the question because it is through living the question that you will find one day that you have lived your way into the answer. And that quote brought me so much comfort as I was going through my awakening because it felt like the foundation of my life was crumbling away and I didn't know who I was becoming. And that was scary. Who was I going to be? when I came out the other side of whatever this was that I was experiencing. So this idea of living the question was really powerful. But here's the quote I want to share with you right now. So as I've shared with you before, I love television. And uh, I was an early adopter of MTV's reality shows. So, Real World, Road Rules, The Challenge. I still love The Challenge, I just have to tell you, I love watching it. And one of the things that's so cool about having watched these shows for so many years is we get to watch people evolve, right? They start off in their early 20s and they're wild and they're just starting out their lives and by now a lot of the people on the challenge have been on the challenge for many many years and we have seen them grow and evolve and one of the people on the show is CT and he's he's larger than life in terms of his personality and he started off as a really wild kid and And he's grown up to be quite an interesting guy over the years. And 
part of his journey was that he was in love with another person on the show who passed away due to cancer. And you know, these things change us, right, somehow. Not that I know him personally. I don't really know what that meant for him. But they had a show a few years ago where he was getting married to his current wife. And so MTV made a show of it. And um, and so a lot of the cast members were coming to the wedding. But this is, this is the reason I'm bringing it all up. I know this might be sounding incongruent and you're wondering, what does this have to do with angels, Laurel? And I don't know that it has anything to do with angels. There's no big angel, ta-da, that's going to happen after this. But there was a moment right before his wedding when his cousin was asking him if he was ready for this, asking CT if he was ready for this. And CT said this, this was... This is the whole reason I have told you this whole little (laughs) tangent. He said, I thought I knew my answer. And just when I knew my answer, life changed the question. Is that not so profound? Just when I thought I knew my answer, life changed the question. And I almost had to stop and breathe when I heard that. And from CT of all people, I loved him from that moment on. I was like, you know what? There is something more to this man than we have seen on reality television. That was a very wise reflection. And I think for so many, we struggle when life changes the question because we wonder, what did I do wrong? What do I do now? Who am I? Who am I becoming? What is life asking of me? And so... These moments of starting in the middle of anywhere. Just starting somewhere. Even if we're not sure where we are. That we don't have to know the beginning. We don't have to know where we're going. But somehow, if we'll just start somewhere something will be born as a result. And I was thinking of that as I was getting ready to record this podcast episode because I didn't have a clear vision of where we were going to go. I'm fortunate enough that I have been teaching for a really long time now. I think I'm in my 16th or 17th year. And I've come to learn to trust the flow. Although, I will tell you that when I feel like I don't know where I'm going, I can get a bit panicked. (laughs) There have been many instances when, especially when I used to teach classes in the evening, and my husband would come home from work, and I would be getting ready to teach my class, and I would I would be in a kind of a panic, and I would say, I got nothing. <laughs> I got nothing. I have no idea what I'm going to talk about. And usually that was because in the class I was channeling. And as a channel, I often do not know what is going to come through. So in those moments, as Laurel... <laughs> I felt disconnected and I thought, am I going to have something interesting and helpful and light-filled to share with the people I'm going to be getting on the phone with in 15 minutes? And my husband is a bit of a wizard, although don't tell him I told you that. He, He really knows stuff, but he doesn't know that he knows stuff. 
So as soon as I would say, I got nothing, he would start bringing forward something. And he will never remember what he says when he does that. But he, he would almost always bring forward some kind of delicious spiritual nugget of wisdom that would wind me up and feed the stream that I was going to be plugging into when I taught. And so that happened quite a bit back then. Not so much anymore. But this morning, because it's morning as I record this, I'm really feeling in the middle of stuff. Not stuff in a way that feels heavy. More like I'm living the question. And maybe my answers aren't as relevant because life is changing the question and that there is merit in giving myself permission to wander and explore and flow into streams of consciousness co-creating with life to see where it takes me so maybe you're experiencing this too. So as I went to record this episode, I just took a deep breath and I said, okay, angels, let's just wander. That I give myself permission to wander and ramble and bring love forward and keep you company. That it's okay to not always know our destination ahead of time. We don't have to plan it all out. Whether it's a podcast episode or whether it's life in general, I support you in giving yourself permission to start in the middle, the messy, middle and wander. Wandering is a skill. It is an art form. And there have been times in my life where I have enjoyed wandering more than others. But for now, let's invoke that part of us that can derive pleasure out of wandering because part of wandering is the ability to be present in the moment, to wander and discover something new that you haven't seen before or seeing something through new eyes. Wandering evokes discovery. There is a piece of prose that I wrote for a poster that always does well on my Facebook page whenever I share it. And it says something along the lines of wander the world with an open heart and let the universe love you. And then there's another prose that says we are meant to wander this world like children do with open hearts and a sense of discovery. I have paraphrased both of those pieces of prose, but that's the spirit. So we're going to wander together a bit here in this episode. The angels and I are going to keep you company as you rest. We're bringing waves of love to you. So I invite you to take a nice deep breath in, allowing the love of God to stream to you now. And allow your body to rest and relax and grow heavy. You have permission to drift off. 
I promise not to share something so important that you have to stay awake. And I'm going to call in the angels, even though they are already here. But I love the ritual of inviting them in. So beautiful angels on high, I invite you to join us here. And I know that you are already here. I invite you to bring forward waves of love to each of our beloveds listening here. Angels, I ask that you clear any old energies, any old patterns of consciousness we no longer need to embody, especially those patterns of not enoughness, of fear and worry that we don't need to carry within us. I ask that you clear this through the heart of God, help to replenish and restore our spirits so that we are so deeply connected with our authentic self, that we are more deeply connected with our guidance as well. And dear ones, just take a beautiful breath in and I feel such glorious, beautiful energy coming in for you right now. This energy feels hopeful. It feels bright. It feels like it is here to nurture you and encourage you. And there's nothing you need to do right now other than to receive. and breathe and allow yourself to rest. And the angels say thank you for making space for this. Thank you for saying yes to receiving the love that is here for you. You are precious in this world and we are so deeply grateful for the gift of you. And so you rest and drift off and while you do, I'm going to ramble and tell you a story. So filing this under the fine art of rambling, I will share with you the inspiration that I had for this episode and really not sure where it's going to go. I thought I was going to read you a story, but as I kind of tuned into the energy, I thought, eh, I don't know, that's not feeling like where we're supposed to go. And then when I was in the shower this morning and for those of you who know me, I tend to get lovely downloads when I'm in the shower. And I've learned to lean into them because often when I get inspiration in the shower, it always leads somewhere magical. But part of the reason I guess I was not sure and why this sort of feels like the middle of an invitation is because often when I get my inspiration, I see the whole blueprint of where we're going. And I don't have the blueprint right now. The angels are just saying, just go, just ramble. It'll take you somewhere. And it doesn't have to take me somewhere super profound, right? One of the things I love so much about sharing these stories with you is they really are snippets of my life. Just little snippets, like if we were 
going out for lunch, we would tell each other stories from our life, right? We might fall into a conversation where we talk about our first pet, and I would tell you about my dog, Christy, and you would tell me about your first pet, right? It's not that these are the most profound stories of our lives, but there is this joy in sharing snippets of our life together. And so I get to do this with you. So this morning in the shower, I got the hit to share with you about my experiences of Evanston, Illinois. Evanston is a suburb of Chicago that is east and a little bit north of Skokie, where I grew up. And part of the reason I wasn't sure about this being a theme is I thought, do I have anything that interesting to share about Evanston? But apparently the angels think that I do. (laughs) So let's see where this goes. At first I thought maybe the angels wanted me to read to you about the history of Evanston. But as I was reading the history of Evanston, nothing about it inspired me. It was founded by Methodists, so it was a Christian township, and it was a dry township, so temperance was a big deal there. Um, It is where Northwestern University was founded and still resides, but Evanston has evolved a lot since its beginnings in 1858 or so. And so I thought I would tell you about my Evanston, which was the Evanston of my high school years, which would have been mid to late 70s and early 80s before I moved to Los Angeles. So as I said, Evanston is home to Northwestern University, and it's a gorgeous campus, just beautiful. And Evanston when I knew it. Again, I I can't speak a lot to what Evanston is like now because I've lived in California for over 35 years, even though I visited back there a lot. But I loved Evanston growing up. It's a really beautiful town or city. I think it's called, I think it's referred to as a town. Forgive me if I'm getting that wrong. These things are important. Like Skokie is a village. <laughs> I'm thinking it's a town because I have Evanston Township. It's on Lake Michigan. And there are parts of Evanston that are so beautiful. Back in the early 1900s, many wealthy people moved to Evanston. And huge, beautiful homes were built extraordinary homes. If you get a chance, go onto a real estate app and look up some of the big old houses of Evanston. They have magnificent woodwork, you know, wood paneling and architecture details and they're enormous and beautifully landscaped. So, in my earlier years, even though I always wanted to move to Los Angeles, my backup plan was to somehow get a mansion in Evanston on the water. I was always mesmerized by Lake Michigan. It was the closest thing we had to an ocean. And so that was my dream, that I would get a big old house in Evanston on the lake. That was that was my plan B. Or in the John Hancock, which is the huge high rise in Chicago, but that's another story. And once I turned 15 and 16, I had a group of girlfriends that I went everywhere with. We didn't go to the same high school, but we met through community theater and we traveled as a pack which I think at that age is what we do right (laughs) we would travel in packs 
we were just at the age of beginning to drive, and that gave us the freedom to go where we wanted to go. So a typical summer day for us would be to go to the beach in Evanston, and we would pack food because food was a big deal for us back then, and we would go to the beach, and the beaches in Evanston are good. They're not like ocean beaches, you know, with miles of sand. Well, kind of rocky. <laughs> Some dead fish sometimes. But it was our version of the beach. It was all we knew. And we would go there. And then, after we had enough of the beach, there was a restaurant that we loved in Evanston called Fritz That's It. If you're from the northern suburbs of that generation, you will likely remember this restaurant, Fritz That's It. That was actually one of the tangents I was contemplating exploring with you because I started thinking of Fritz That's It and they were part of the Let Us Entertain You restaurant chain. And it's Let Us as L-E-T-T-U-C-E, as in romaine lettuce, not, you know, allow us. It, it was about leafy greens. Let us entertain you. And they're still in business, the let us entertain you, not Fritz, that's it. It was founded by a restaurateur, Rich Melman, and he was famous throughout the Chicago area for his over-the-top restaurants. And Fritz That's It was one of them. So Fritz That's It was known for huge portions of whatever the food was. And this enormous salad bar. Enormous. It had everything on it that you could imagine, including this amazing dish called chocolate chip cream cheese. It was a dip, which basically was cheesecake in dip form with chocolate chips. And they also had delicious decadent French onion soup. Now here's why I'm telling you about these two dishes. So my girlfriends and I were, were probably 16, 17 years old at this point. And it would be the late 1970s. So we certainly had grown up with diet culture. I had for sure, because I had been on Weight Watchers by that point. But, you know, unless you had this little pamphlet of a calorie counter book, we didn't know about calories. We didn't know this stuff. You know, now you go to Burger King or whatever, Chipotle, and everything has the calorie counts. Like, we understand how calories work now. We didn't know that back then. We didn't know how many calories were in things. We didn't know that stuff. In our mind, soup and salad was diet food. <laughs> what did we know? So we would go to the beach, and then we would go get soup and salad at Fritz That's It, because that was healthy. <laughs> but there was nothing healthy about what we were eating. So we would go to the massive salad bar. I mean, you've never seen a salad bar like this unless perhaps you go to Vegas. It, it had everything on it. And we would pile our plates high with everything, and dressing, of course, right? Because if you're going to get a ginormous salad, it requires a lot of dressing. Blue cheese dressing, we loved. I think we all had a thing for blue cheese dressing. And of course, chocolate chip cream cheese, right? It's cream cheese. What's bad about cream cheese? It just has a few chocolate chips in it. And we would get the French onion soup which, if you've never had it, it typically is very buttery. Like, there's butter in there. I think that's what they, you know, cook the onions up in. And 
it's served in a tureen that is hot because they have they have to put it under um, the grill to melt the cheese. So you've got this very buttery, decadent French onion soup, and then they put a piece of toasted bread or a crouton on top of the soup, and then a huge amount of cheese, high fat cheese like Gruyere or something, because it's going to melt. And then they put it under the broiler. So they bring out this tureen of French onion soup with the crouton and at least a pound of melted cheese because it's Fritz, that's it. And everything's over the top. So my girlfriends and I, we would go to Fritz, that's it and get French onion soup and the salad bar and think we were having a balanced meal. (laughs) I just laugh about that now. And there were times that we would order it the French onion soup without the crouton because, you know, we shouldn't have bread. (laughs) Hold the crouton. But give me a lot of that chocolate chip cream cheese. We didn't know. I'm glad we didn't know because we really enjoyed our food back then. And then we would roll out of there. I just remember these massive plates of salad which if it had only been vegetables, that would have, right, that would have met the criteria with maybe a little bit of protein, but that's not how we ate our salads back then. We piled it high with everything and dressing with the French onion soup, often sans crouton, because we were on a diet. And, um, So part of my Evanston memories were all those meals at Fritz, that's it. And Evanston also was a place that I would daydream about. Uh, I don't know how many of you were daydreamers or are daydreamers. I've always been a huge daydreamer. And I would often daydream because it would help me disconnect from whatever was happening that I found difficult. And it didn't necessarily have to be something traumatic. It, I could be sitting in algebra class. I didn't want to be there. So I would launch my consciousness somewhere else. And one of the things I loved so much about Evanston was the lake being near Lake Michigan. And on some of the parts of Lake Michigan, there are rock walls, like boulders that had been put in place to keep the lake from eroding the shore. And there are certain places along the shore where you can just go out and you sort of have to be a bit nimble, which I was much more nimble back in the day, and you can climb onto the rocks and find a place to sit and just watch the lake. And it was always so beautiful. So often when I was somewhere I didn't want to be, like algebra class, in my mind, I would go visit the rocks in Evanston. And I would just imagine going out there and sitting and thinking. Sometimes in my imagination, a friend would meet me there. And now that I understand more about meditating and our mystical connections, I think, wow, even back then I was doing this in a way, right? I don't like where I am. I'm going to go manifest myself somewhere else. I'm going to go split my reality. (laughs) I'll keep enough of myself here in the desk, at the desk, so no one knows that I'm missing. I'm going to go sit on the rocks in Evanston. And while I'm at the rocks in Evanston, I'm going to play the guitar. Even though I don't really know how to play the guitar in life, I'm going to play the guitar while I'm there. And a friend is going to join me. 
And so I would have these expanses of time where I would just almost bilocate and the rocks in Evanston was one of the places that I would go. One of the things I did when I was trying to understand why the angels had me focus on Evanston for this episode was to go and look up real estate in Evanston to see what kind of old houses were available. And I found this one house for sale and it's three million dollars. So just a little spare change there, but it's right on the lake where the rocks are. And it's an old house. I think the listing said it was built in 19 something, 1908. I don't know. Honestly, it wasn't paying attention to that part, but it has been extensively landscaped so that there is a brick patio right at the rocks overlooking the lake. And a part of me, when I was looking at the listing, I almost wanted to cry because that was the vision that I had for so long, not necessarily the brick patio, but this dream of a house that was right there at the rocks on Lake Michigan and Evanston. That was my sanctuary. Even if I didn't go there in my physical form very often, I went there a lot astrally in spirit. And it brought me a tremendous amount of comfort. So I thought that was so interesting to look at that listing. So I thought I would share with you this listing. So let's go. We'll do a little real estate tour. So this house is $3.1 million. It's four bedrooms, two and a half bath on half an acre. It was built in 1909, so I was close. And it has a one car garage. This is the listing. Magnificent opportunity to own a private lakefront retreat with exclusive riparian rights. I had to look that up. That's water rights to, to like the bank of a, of a lake or a river. Situated on over a half acre lot with 55 feet of lakefront access and an expansive length of 411 feet. This four bedroom, two and a half bath home is the definition of classic elegance. Enjoy your morning coffee from the rooftop deck, watching the waves crash against the shoreline. No detail was overlooked in the million dollar landscaping project, including the installation of two beautiful rear brick paver patios, ideal for alfresco dining. The custom kitchen has been remodeled with the crisp white cabinets and an abundance of built-in storage. Isn't that beautiful? So one of the pictures that just took my breath away was of the backyard. There's some grass and some landscaping and some big rocks overlooking Lake Michigan. And then there's a picture of the rocks, just the rocks leading into the lake and that was the place that I found so much comfort during those tumultuous teenage years even if I didn't go in person I went there in consciousness so just it's so interesting that this wandering this rambling that the angels have led me on today led me back to remembering the rocks in Evanston and something about seeing that picture. It felt like home. Isn't that interesting? So there were aspects of Evanston that I just loved growing up and no big story to share with you here, right? Just little snippets of 
a place that I loved that helped create an imprint for me that felt safe and that felt welcoming. And in my later years, I would still go to Evanston quite a bit with my mom and dad. So there's a restaurant in Evanston. It might be Wilmette. Wilmette and Evanston are really close to each other. So forgive me, maybe just over the border into Wilmette. I'm not sure. But it's the original Pancake House, Walker Brothers. And I think they're part of a chain now, so they may have them in other places, but growing up, it seemed like it just belonged to us, that it was just ours. And it's a pancake house. And my parents loved it. I don't remember going a lot as a kid, probably to take two adults and three kids to Walker Brothers would cost a lot and we didn't eat out a lot as a family back then but as my parents got older and as we kids kind of moved into our adult lives and moved out my parents would go to Walker Brothers for their birthdays or their anniversary and so it was always a special treat for them so when I would come into town I would get to go to Walker Brothers with them which was always lovely my mom always got the blueberry waffle. That was her favorite. And my dad always got um, eggs and bacon. <laughs> my dad didn't have many opportunities to eat bacon in life. My mom didn't cook it because in some ways, you know, being Jewish, we didn't eat much in the way of pork products. So my dad got to have his bacon at Walker Brothers and over the years and even after my father passed we would go to Walker Brothers with my mom for birthdays and special occasions and she would get her blueberry waffle oh, I feel like I should go somewhere and have a blueberry waffle to honor my mom and so that's definitely another one of my Evanston memories, even if it may be in Wilmette, I don't remember. But it's just really close to Evanston. And Evanston also has a lot of really cool shops. It has a rock shop, so long before I knew about mystical stores, there's Dave's Rock Shop, which has fossils and all kinds of minerals and crystals, now that I think that those are super cool. And there was a really awesome fabric store for a long time called Vogue Fabric. And my mom used to make our clothes, not all of them, but she would make clothes for us. And so it was always an adventure to get to go to Vogue Fabric and pick out a fabric in a butterick pattern. How many of you grew up with that, uh, your mom's, and I'm sorry, maybe dad sewed back then too. I think it was mostly women and girls who were in home ec and we learned how to use a sewing machine. And so we would get to go to Vogue Fabric and pick out the fabric for a new skirt or a blouse. And then my mom would make it for us. I thought that's how it worked for everybody or the Halloween costumes. We're going to do a whole Halloween episode, so. But I do remember getting to go to Vogue Fabric and picking out a Butterick pattern for a costume and then getting the fabric for it. Super cool. So I really love Evanston, Illinois. I have a lot of really wonderful memories of it. I haven't been back in years, and I'm not quite sure why I am rambling to you about Evanston in this episode, but since it is a sleep podcast, the threshold for me to entertain you is very low, because <laughs> hopefully you will be asleep, and you will not realize that I have just been rambling about some patchwork quilt memories 
about my time in Evanston, Illinois. And if you're having dreams of huge platters of salad and French onion soup mix, I apologize. Uh, that just cracks me up. And, you know, being a foodie, oh, I loved their salad bar. I had to go back onto Google and look for some pictures of it, and it was pretty massive. And I'm sure now it would be super easy to find a chocolate chip cream cheese recipe, but remember back then, we didn't have Google. So we would only get to figure out how to make it if they published a recipe in the Sun-Times or the Tribune. Um, it wasn't as easy to gain access to recipes and things like that as it is now. So we coveted the chocolate chip cream cheese on the salad bar. I'm sure we ate 2,000 calories back then at a single go and thought we were being good. <laughs> And just as an aside, Let Us Entertain You had a restaurant in Beverly Hills called RJ's, and they also had a massive salad bar. But by the time I moved to LA, I understood nutrition a bit better. So I did not go crazy on the salad bar like I did in my teenage years. But we had the metabolism of teenage girls back then, so we could handle it. But just envision, you know, five or six teenage girls, giant plates piled high with salad and dressing and French onion soup. <laughs> that just cracks me up. So as I've shared with you before, almost every memory I have is associated with food. So there you go. Somehow in my wanderings and my memories of Evanston, I have included with you two different food memories, Fritz That's It and Walker Brother Pancakes. See, that's how everything lives in my consciousness. And I also managed to weave in early experiences of what we might call wandering meditation to my rocks in Evanston when I was somewhere I didn't want to be, I would, in my mind, travel to my rocks in Evanston and sit there and contemplate at the lakefront. And I've also shared with you an early dream that I would grow up and be someone who had a house on the lake in Evanston, which did not come to pass. But that's okay because... I love my life now, and this is where I live, and I live a life now where I rarely wander off somewhere else in my mind, because I enjoy being where I dwell now, and I have incorporated my beautiful ability to meander through dimensional realities into my profession so I get to talk to angels and bring forward messages. So these are my ramblings with you in this episode and I hope something has come forward to warm your heart or amuse you. See, we were in the middle the whole time. We didn't have a beginning. We don't have an end. We've just wandered in the middle like a conversation we might have if we go out to lunch together and I tell a little story and then you tell a little story like maybe right now if we were having lunch together in person you would be telling me about where you used to go in high school with your friends and what brought you comfort back then what were the dreams that you were seeding back then? And do any of them still have relevance to you? Like, I don't dream of having a home in Evanston anymore. But I tell you, it made me very contented to revisit that dream today. To look at that house that I read to you about. 
kind of practical side, I will say, about that house, I noticed that it has separate faucets for the hot and cold water, which is a plumbing convention of the days of old. That's back when the drinking water came from one source and the hot water came from another. So you had a separate tap for hot water and a separate tap for cold water. And I noticed that they had that in both of the bathrooms. And I thought, oh, I don't know if their plumbing has been updated. Because typically, when you choose to update plumbing, most people don't want to have a separate hot and cold water tap. You want it to come out of the same faucet. So for $3 million, I'm not sure they have updated the plumbing in the bathrooms. So it'd be a fixer, <laughs> a little bit of a fixer if I were to somehow win the lottery and decide to purchase a lakefront home in Evanston, which I'm not going to do. If I were going to have lottery house money, I would definitely stay in California somewhere. But who knows? Do you ever do that? Dream of your lottery house? Where's your lottery house? Where would it be? What would it be like? I love dreaming of that stuff. Every once in a while, I go into one of the real estate apps and I put in you know, something with acres of property priced over $5 million to see what comes up. Let's all dream of our lottery houses. And maybe one of us will get it. Wouldn't that be cool? And then you can invite me over. <laughs> okay, if you win the lottery and you have a lottery house, I am open to an invitation to come over and celebrate at your lottery house. So hopefully somewhere in our family of sleepy bedtime listeners, several lottery houses will be manifested. And for now, I am grateful for the home that we have. <laughs> I'm grateful for the life that I have. I am grateful to have a life now that I don't have to wander away from very often because I love being where I am. And I am grateful for all of the memories and the joy and the experiences that I have had that have created the tapestry of my life. And I'm grateful that you allow me the blessing of sharing these moments with you. So that's it, my friends, ramblings from Vallejo, California, underneath the blanket fort, where we just wandered in the middle of a conversation. Thank you for letting me share it with you. I love you very much. You have a good rest. And if you're not quite ready to go to sleep and you need some more companionship, you can queue up another episode. There are lots of them in the library now. I love you. You take good care. And we'll talk again soon. Thank you.